Firstly, I must uh, thank uh, Prof. Tilakvira Surya and uh, his esteemed colleagues here for inviting me for this uh, very important session. Actually, I'm uh, very happy, actually delighted to be here for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, of course, being with you. See, I see the KDU as a somewhat unique institution. See, most universities profess two things. Most universities profess two things. Medical faculties profess, most universities profess one thing. Medical faculties profess two things. KDU professes three things. Therefore, I think it is a singular honor for me also to be pa part of this occasion. Universities profess education, which is truth. They profess truth. Medical faculties and schools of medicine and the medical profession profess health. KDU professes education, health, and your defense professors security. So I think that's an amalgam that very few universities in Sri Lanka have the honor to represent. So I'm pleased to be part of this. Now my, my talk, I have two, another good reason for being here, and that is my friend, uh, my colleague, um, Peradenia alumnus uh, who grew up, to, I won't say student, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's always uh, good to spend some time with Tilak because we have done so many things together. Now, my topic is health and sustainable development or development and impact. As you can understand, there are three, four things here, which by each one by itself is a seminar. But therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a almost like a kaleidoscope of snapshots, looking at different things from different places. It's a kind of bird's eye view of this topic, which certainly is not going to be covering any anything in, in some degree of comprehensiveness. This is, a, this is a defining report. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sunda will know about this. This was a UN which released its first, the first issue of what is now called the Human Development Report. This was first on 1991, the first issue. And this is probably one of the most quoted uh, parts of, of, of uh, uh, that report, uh, certainly, and also one of the most quoted uh, paragraphs in, uh, in uh, development per se, in human development, which says, People are the real wealth of a nation. The basic objective of development is to create an enabling environment for people to live long, healthy, and creative lives. This may appear to be a simple truth, but it is often forgotten in the immediate concern with the accumulation of commodities and financial wealth. So I think I'm, it's appropriate that I follow Saroj uh, who set the scene for this. Now that's, that's what the HDR says and which is quoted very often. The human development itself, this is from Amartya Singh, one of the Nobel Prize winners from our region, from India, when he won the Nobel Prize, I think in 1998. He says, human development is a process of enlarging people's choices. The most critical ones are to lead a long and healthy life, to be educated, and to enjoy a decent standard of living. Please note that the health, your health part comes almost pre, preeminent, predominant. I, I won't read the whole thing. I'll, I'm going to skip a lot of slides to in, in, the, in the interest of time. Then we use this word sustainable development. Sustainable development, many people define in different ways, but this is one of the definitions I picked up some time ago. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the future. This requires that we see the world as a system. Please note the word system. And therefore, sustainable development has two, con two, two, two separate parts. One is the concept of needs, the essential needs of the world, who are getting the priority, and the idea of limitations imposed by technology, by social organization, on the environmental ability to meet the present and future needs. Therefore, human development, almost by its definition, has to be sustainable. That's the, the preamble to my presentation on the international agencies. There are measures of development, I won't go into this, the GNP, GDP, PPP, then there are multiple indices, health, the human development index. These are various ways of saying what to get a measure of what is going on. Next, a word or two about health. Health is defined by the WHO in the Constitution as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being 
and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The second part is quite important. Health is not the absence of disease or the infirmity, but, but if you look at the definition of the WHO, state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, that's an ideal state. I don't think anyone born to date is really has achieved that. So therefore, it's a, what we call an aspirational goal. We, everyone aspires to go as close to this as possible. This defi definition has stood the test of time. It has not been changed, except uh, about 20 years ago, there was a proposal from India, Dr. Bisht, uh, from uh, whom you know very well, isn't he? He, huh? he was my director. Yeah, he was your director. He made a proposal to the World Health Assembly that we must introduce the word spiritual well-being which I think goes with us. I mean, it, we can identify with that suggestion. But of course, due to politics, the WHO is full of politics all, of all types. They said no, not immediately. But I think it's a good thing to add because what Dr. Bish said was, a person can have physical, mental, social well-being, but still can be a wolf. The th thing that distinguishes between a wolf who would have all these things and a human being would be that he or she has some spiritual values. And then, I won't go to that in now. Then what is international health? International health is basically health that is beyond boundaries of a single nation or a state. What it means? Simply because bacteria, viruses, water, all these resources and, and, and the, the, the agents of disease are oblivious to what we call states, nations. There are no artificial boundaries. These are for all of them artificial boundaries. So we need to have cross-border links to promote health. Now look at this. Other reason is I'm this is referring to what Saroj said. A child born in Glasgow, in a suburb of Glasgow, this data, Sri Lanka data would be the same. We don't have good data, but otherwise it would uh, read the same. You can substitute Colombo to uh, Glasgow. Suburb can expect a life 20 years shorter than another living in Glasgow, same town, 13 kilometers away. This is a Mahmoud's report, the social determinants report of Mahmoud, in the same town. Big difference. 20 years shorter, just note, it's not just one, two years. Life expectancy is 20 years less in the same same town in two different parts. If you take Kalambu, I'm sure if you take all the Vatas and the rest of Kalambu, the richer parts of Kalambu, I'm sure there will be a reasonable, reasonably, not, not not this, but there will be a difference. A girl in Lesotho is likely to live 42 years less than another in Japan. In Sweden, the risk of a woman dying during pregnancy and childbirth is one in 1,700. 17,400. Afghanistan, the odds are one in eight. Biology does not explain any of this. Instead, the differences are between and within countries result from social environment, what Saroj was trying to say. Now, this is another reason why international health becomes relevant and useful, not only useful, I would say essential. This has, international health has a long history. And as you, you would guess, particularly the younger members in this audience, I think most of you are medical students, you should understand that international health is an old story. But in the beginning, international health was mainly trying to prevent diseases because ships are moving from place to place, carrying bacteria, carrying goods, but along with that, diseases are going around the world. So therefore, the first part of disease diplomacy was regarding public health related to infections. And that led to what is called the first International Sanitary Conference in Paris in 1851. That's the first organized attempt to organize international health. Went on, then it got better organized in the 20th century, and the Nobel Prize for Medicine came in the beginning of this uh, last century in 1901. And even in the 20th century, as we moved on, people are looking ahead, and health was getting better organized. These are some of the things which happened. This, each of these led to big institutions which came up. Came up. The first one, what Maynard Keynes was doing, the Bretton Woods is the, the, the founding of uh, the bank group, which, which uh, where Sunda comes from. That was the beginning of that. When Euro European Union came with, uh, with, the, with the work of John Monet, then lastly, of course, the UN came soon after or during the discussions or during the Second World War in the last century. Why do people, why do people contribute to international, why do, why do people want to, the particular rich countries, why do they contribute money to, uh, to have these programs of international health? Very simple, it's uh, almost common sense for you. Firstly, national protection. National protection to protect their own people. And defense against introduced diseases, both there are people going out and other people coming in. Secondly, there is a desire for goodwill, there's a desire for influence, there's a desire for prestige. 
Thirdly, to support and protect private investments, becoming quite important now, today, to further knowledge and research in medicine, and of course, in response to specific requests, as we heard from Dr. Mahipal earlier. Now I am coming to some of the organizations which are involved in international health very quickly. Can divide them into three types. Firstly, what we call multilateral organizations. Predominantly the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the United Nations Children's Fund, the UR is called UNFPA, the Population Fund, which is called UNFPA, which was called UNFPA, other agencies, the other UN agencies, and we have two other global organizations now, what is called the GFATM, the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, GFATM, and GAVI, which is mainly supporting immunization, Global Alliance. Second set are what are called bilateral organizations. These are the countries which work by means two, with the, 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 the supporting country and the recipient country. USAID, DFID, DFID is the British one,